Kia ora everyone and welcome to tonight's Goodfellow Unit webinar on adult transgender patient care. I'm Dr Louise Kugler from the Goodfellow Unit and tonight we'll hear from two guests. Our first speaker is Jennifer Shields, the Interim Director at Qtopia and is also Rainbow People's Health and Wellbeing Advisor at Pegasus Health. She is also part of the Waitaha Transgender Health Working Group. Jennifer has been working in the trans community advocacy space for over 10 years and was recently a co-author on gender affirming hormone therapy initiation guidelines. Our second guest, we welcome back Dr. Rona Carroll. Rona is a GP with a special interest in transgender care and a senior lecturer at Otago University. Rona works in gender affirming healthcare within the student health service with a focus on initiating gender affirming hormone therapy. She led the writing of the primary care gender affirming hormone therapy initiation guidelines. Jennifer, welcome to the webinar tonight and I'll hand over to you. Kia ora, my name's Jen, my pronouns are she and her. Um, thanks for that introduction. Uh, like we said, I am currently Interim Director and Healthcare Lead at Qtopia, Rainbow People Health and Wellbeing Advisor at Pegasus Health, uh, and I'm also currently the Vice President of PATHA, the Professional Association for Trans Health Aotearoa. Um, if you're unfamiliar, Qtopia, we are a social support and social change service for the whole Rainbow community based down here in Ototahi Christchurch, working uh, all throughout Te Waipunamu wherever we're needed and running a primary care workforce development program around the country. Um, there are three areas of focus for us as an organization and health is a really big one. So we hold this partnership contract with Pegasus Health um, to provide them with support, uh, policy, consultation and training across their services. We have a peer support service funded by Te Whato Ora Waitaha for any transgender diverse or questioning person in Waitaha Canterbury regardless of age and have um, been quite involved in the development of new pathways and services here in Waitaha Canterbury over the last 10 years. Um, there's a bunch of other stuff we do as an organisation across education and social services and um, other areas of workforce development as well, but we're here for health today so I'll, I'll keep it brief. I think it's always useful to start with some kind of stats and grounding. Um, data around Aotearoa's rainbow communities and trans and non-binary communities is still pretty thin on the ground. Um, you might have noticed in the most recent census, we asked questions about sexuality and gender for the first time, um, which is fantastic. It means that once this next survey data, uh, census data comes out, we'll have some population level data for the whole country. Um, looking at recent overseas research, I think conservative estimates would put the rainbow community at about 10% of the general population, and we're expecting um, the trans and non-binary community to sit around that 2% mark as well. Some of the best data we do have in Aotearoa comes from a survey series out of the University of Waikato called Counting Ourselves, first carried out in 2018, um, the big health and well-being focus, looking at Aotearoa's trans and non-binary communities. They've just finished another survey round at the end of last year, so soon we'll have some uh, data to compare against and track how things have changed over the last five years. Um, Counting Ourselves really affirmed a lot of what we knew anecdotally, but was really beneficial to have it in hard data. Um, and we had some really interesting demographic findings when it came to Aotearoa's trans community as well. And the big one was that um, people who identify as non-binary or not aligned with strictly man or woman or, you know, male or female are actually the biggest population group within this community, um, which certainly surprised some of us. It was a really interesting um, finding. So I'm really interested to see how that's changed. Counting ourselves found that really high levels of participants were wanting but not able to access gender affirming healthcare, whether that was things like hormone therapy or puberty blockers, uh, surgical interventions, uh, speech and language therapy, hair removal, readiness assistance, mental health support, the whole spectrum of gender affirming healthcare. When we say participants, we're talking about just over a thousand um, trans and non-binary people from all around Aotearoa from age 14 up until I think the oldest participant was in their 70s. Um, so really across the age spectrum, um, really well represented all around the country. Um, some of the biggest, I guess, factors that prevented people being able to access this care were uh, not knowing where to go, 
having to travel pretty extensively to access healthcare and having to pay out of pocket to access that care as well. Um, Cutting ourselves also found that a pretty significant portion of this community had avoided seeing a doctor um, uh, because of how they were worried about being disrespected or mistreated. So 36%, just over a third of this community, not accessing general health care at all. Um, and also found that another good chunk of that community had avoided seeing a doctor because of that cost barrier as well. So this that stat in particular is one of the big drivers behind Qtopia's kind of workforce development program um, here in Waitaha is that 36% of avoiding seeing a doctor because it's one of the relatively easy wins we can put in place as well. Um, something we talk about a lot and I'll talk a little bit more on in a bit is um, how much of an impact that visibility can make. So we're thinking about this barrier, we're thinking about someone who is outside of your service, feeling maybe a little anxious, maybe they've heard some talk in the community about people who've had negative experiences, maybe they've had a negative experience themselves in the past. How can they look at your service from the outside and know that it's a place that they'll feel safe, welcomed, accepted, able to be able to share about who they are without that concern? Visibility is kind of the biggest tool in our kit for that kind of thing. It's especially relevant because it's a community that has some particular and pretty intense health and wellbeing outcomes. So counting ourselves found that 71% of participants aged 15 and older reported high, very high levels of psychological distress, compared with only 8% of the general population in Aotearoa, so about nine times the rate. We know that it's a community that's overrepresented in some of these health and wellbeing outcomes around self-harm and suicide, mental health, depression, anxiety. Um, as well as substance abuse and homelessness as well. But the research is also starting to identify some really great protective factors, which I want to touch on a little bit more today, because I feel like we've all got a pretty good understanding of the deficit. Um, so counting ourselves found that participants who are supported by at least half of their whānau were almost half as likely to have attempted suicide in the last 12 months, um, which is a pretty fantastic outcome. And that's something we see in the international research as well. So this study uh, from 2016 in the Journal of Pediatrics looked at a cohort of trans children who were supported in their identities. So we're talking about kids whose gender is different from the sex they were assigned at birth. Um, they had come out to their families, come out to their parents, and had been supported in that affirmed gender and supported in what we call their social transition. So uh, being able to change their name, change their pronoun, change their appearance, get a haircut, change their wardrobe, those relatively easy things um, that are easy to do and also easy to change again in the future if um, their identity is in flux. These kids hadn't engaged in the medical side of things, were just talking that social affirmation, and their rates of depression and anxiety dropped back to being on par of the general population, which is a really significant and fantastic outcome. So when we're talking about families, when I'm talking to parents and families, this is a study that I share with them because so many parents are really worried about their young person's life and their future. Um, and we're talking about adult healthcare today, but so much of the research is on kind of exclusively young people, um, but we can draw some pretty clear conclusions for this from the whole population as well. Um, so that family and parental support and that social affirmation is kind of the number one protective factor. And it also makes pretty clear that these health and wellbeing outcomes aren't inevitable to this population group, right? It comes as a result of kind of navigating through a world that doesn't see you and affirm you for who you are. Language is the other really big one. So the second study from 2018 uh, looked at, uh, again, a group of gender diverse young people. The research is really keen on the young people. I can't wait until we start to see some more research on our adult cohort, especially because in Kutropi, we're seeing more and more people coming out later in life. I think the oldest person in my peer support books is in her 80s. But the study looked at, again, a group of gender diverse young people and specifically looked at whether their name and pronoun was used correctly across four different contexts. So they looked at home, at work, at school, and with their friends. And they found that just one of those contexts, getting that name and pronoun right, was correlated with a reduction of suicidal behavior by 56%, which is fantastic, even if that was the only place where they got that affirmation. Obviously, the outcomes are best when that can be used across all four contexts, um, but it shows how significant just one affirming environment can be. 
And I think this has some practical implications for us in health as well, because again, we can draw some conclusions from this and thinking that, well, if one context has more of an impact than we might have imagined, one person is probably going to have more of an impact than we could imagine as well. So language is something that does take time and a bit of practice. Um, there are some strategies we can put into place to kind of systematize that and to embed that practice into our work. Um, but it's a relatively small thing that we can do that can have a really big impact. Finally, uh, gender affirming care and medical care in particular. So this study looked at a cohort of 104 trans and non-binary young people aged 13 to 20. Um, and tracked them over 12 months and tracked whether they'd received gender affirming care, including puberty blockers and hormone therapy, and found that that receipt of gender affirming care was associated with 60% lower odds of moderate or severe depression and 73% lower odds of suicidality over that 12 months. So gender affirming care and medical transition and medical affirmation aren't something that's part of everyone's journey. Um, I like to describe transition as a bit of a buffet and that you have a lot of options in front of you and you can pick and choose what feels right for you and when. You can load up your plate with dessert before you eat dinner if that's what you want, um, but it really is an individual journey. But for those whom this kind of care is a significant part of that journey, it has a really big positive benefit for their mental well-being. I talk about these three studies in particular because uh, this community and this kind of care is a hot topic at the moment, um, particularly with this election coming up. It's kind of entered the public sphere um, and there's a lot of disinformation swirling out there at the moment about gender affirming care, about gender diverse people, about the rainbow community more at large. Um, it's really politically motivated. Um, we've got some really clear research from organizations like the Disinformation Project that um, uh, have a really explicit in that this kind of disinformation is coming from the exact same social spaces as the disinformation around vaccines and mandates. So that same community is now focused on this kind of care. A lot of it's been imported from the states um, pretty wholeheartedly. So it's really useful to keep coming back to what we know to be true, right? Because there's a lot of noise out there. There's a lot of people telling us we're doing the wrong thing. Um, what we know to be true, what we can see in the research, what we can see in these peer reviewed papers, what I get to see working with my community, um, what the clinicians I get to work with, like Rona, get to see in the patients they work with, what they hear from their colleagues and their peers. The evidence is so clear, right? What we know to be true is that being affirmed in our genders, having that support from our Fano and our community, accessing gender affirming healthcare when we need it, and being able to access really good mental health support saves lives. So regardless of the turmoil, the discussions, regardless of what certain political parties might be wanting to say in the media at the moment to stir up some votes, we keep coming back to what we know to be true, which is that this kind of care is saving lives. I want to touch on some language and terms pretty briefly. Um, I'm not going to give a full glossary today because there's lots of resources out there we can go and read, and I'm happy to share some resources with attendees afterwards as well. Um, what I think is more important for this particular context is letting you all know that language relating to the rainbow community changes all the time, right? The acronym LGBTQIA plus shifts and grows on a regular basis. You'll see LGBT, you'll see LGBTQ, some acronyms have other letters thrown in there. Most important part about the acronym is the plus on the end, because that really means we're including everyone, even if, if we haven't got your particular letter. And it's totally, totally okay to ask, right? Don't be worried if someone shares something with you and you're like, oh my God, I've never heard that before in my life because it happens to me all the time and this is my day job. Um, in fact, I think a really useful follow-up question 100% of the time is something like, tell me about what that means for you. Because even if you're familiar with the terms people are using, two people who use the same words to describe themselves could have really different experiences. So saying something like, you know, thanks so much for sharing that with me. It's great that you feel comfortable sharing that. Tell me a bit more about what that means for you. Let's that person share in as much or as little detail as they feel comfortable, relevant to the context that you're in and the conversation that you're having about what that looks like for them. It can give you some really rich detail about that identity that can really help guide your practice. I will just touch on um, some of these newer terms in here. So MVP FAF, I think is really worth talking about. That's an acronym for a whole host of identities from across the Pacific. 
um, diverse sexualities and gender identities have existed all across the world in a whole range of different cultures for generations and generations. And that holds true for our Pacific whānau and for here in Aotearoa as well. Um, a lot of these identities and labels um, uh, have been persistent throughout history the whole time. Some of them um, have been lost a little bit through the process of colonization, but there's been a real big resurgence and renaissance as people have been able to reconnect with these aspects of their culture. Um, and it's the same here in Aotearoa. Uh, Takatāpui is the kupu Māori for a Māori person who identifies within the community. And it's important to acknowledge that that's not a direct translation of gay or rainbow or trans or anything like that, but its own identity within Te Ao Māori. And it's actually a, a kupu that we have that predates colonisation. So when we're talking about gender identity, we're talking about your personal sense of your own gender. Everyone has a gender identity that can correlate with your presumed sex at birth or differ from it. No one can tell you what your gender identity is. That's something you experience and know for yourself. Gender expression are the ways that we can kind of communicate that gender to the outside world. Sex are the physical parts of our bodies that we think of as either male or female that we're presumed to be at birth. And sexuality is the way that people experience and express sexual attraction. So the important thing to understand about those four concepts is that they all exist in relationship to each other, but they don't necessarily always translate into each other or match, right? So a sex isn't always the same as someone's gender identity. Someone's gender identity doesn't always match their gender expression. It's pretty common for trans and gender diverse folks to take some time for that external expression to match that internal identity as they come out and navigate their own journey. I think it's also important to acknowledge that there isn't necessarily any requirement for someone's gender expression to match their gender identity. Because when we're talking about expression, we're talking about things like clothes and hairstyles and body language. And all of the gender that we attach to that is something that we really code into it as a society, right? They're things that are really fluid. If you're looking at uh, what men's clothes and women's clothes looked like 100, 200 years ago versus what they look like now, there's been a big shift. Um, which shows, I guess, how um, we have kind of constructed that meaning. So a lot of people are kind of rejecting the idea that how they express themselves has to match or reflect um, their internal identity um, in, in traditional means. What that means for us is that we can't necessarily always tell someone's gender identity by looking at them because the external gender expression might not match that identity on the inside. And then sexuality sits alongside those altogether. So someone who is trans or gender diverse or non-binary can also be gay, straight, bisexual, etc. Because one is about who we are and who we feel ourselves to be. And the other is about who we have relationships with, who we fall in love with, who we have sex with. I want to touch briefly on um, uh, some of the specific issues for healthcare around trans folks and thinking about gendered care in particular. Um, in the green room, we were just talking about uh, menopause is, is a topic that is coming up at the moment. Um, we could think about kind of breastfeeding and um, pregnancy. We could think about cervical cancer. Um, some of the care that we provide to people is, is gendered, right, depending on the bodies that they have. So everyone's different and everyone has their own preferences, approach, comfort, terms they use for their body. Some people are totally okay and prefer to use really clear and concise clinical terms for their body. Other people might have their own preferences. So it's important to check in and ask. You could say something like, you know, what terms do you like to use for your body or for this body part? It's important that we're really clear what we're talking about because this is clinical information, but it's also important that you're comfortable, right? So making sure that everyone's on the same page and we're trying to ensure as much comfort as we can. Transparency and clarity really is a golden tool for so many areas of this work, right? If we're able to communicate why we need to do something, why we have a con why we need to have a conversation, why something is happening, and people understand why something is happening, it can really shift the experience for that person as well, rather than um, them feeling like it just has is happening and they have no understanding or control over it. So transparency and clarity is really fantastic. Similarly, sometimes we're working with some pretty clunky medical IT systems. Um, medical IT isn't the best at keeping up to date. Um, I know many practices are still out there working with MedTech 32, which does not have great fields for things like gender or pronouns or options beyond that male, female, unknown marker. 
Um, so again, transparency and clarity is really beneficial. You're totally allowed to say to a trans patient, like, hey, the patient system we use uh, is really limited. It, you know, these are the boundaries. These are the options we have available. You know, our system will only let, uh, only has one field for sex and it lets us choose M, F or U. Which do you feel best reflects your identity? What you, what, what you, what would you prefer we write you down as, right? There are lots of different systems and ways we can make these systems work for us. Um, I know some practices use flags for things like pronouns. I know at my practice, my uh, patient file has an F on it and there's a flag somewhere that says does not have a cervix, doesn't need a smear. Um, lots of different ways we can work around that system. Sometimes we might need to switch a gender marker in order to access a referral. We had a case here in Canterbury where we have a contract for funding for long-acting reproductive contraceptive, um, which was initially only available to patients with an F on their marker, and we had a few um, trans men who would have otherwise been eligible, and their GPs were needing to flip that marker on their file back to F, make the referral, and send it back. Um, so they were able to explain why they were doing that to the patient, but they also let Pegasus um, and the DHB know that this was an, was an issue, and we were able to get that funding contract updated and fixed. So now it's accessible regardless of what your gender marker on your file says. So if you encounter issues like that, explain why what's happening needs to happen and make sure to let someone know so we can resolve that in the system. Similarly, offer to update uh, someone's information in your PMS and with the NHI, remembering that you are able to update a patient's information on the NHI anytime. There's no requirement for a legal name change or a um, birth certificate change. There's no requirement to cite any documentation. You're able to do that for gender diverse patients at any time, which is great. Um, but also explain that some systems might not update, right? So our systems aren't always the best at talking to each other. Updating the NHI won't necessarily change it everywhere let them know that there might still be some systems that are using a previous name and they might have to update themselves. Um, but you can also ring ahead for referrals, especially if you're referring for some specifically gendered care, like fertility treatments. It can be helpful to provide lots of information on that referral and ring ahead to let them know that, hey, my patient's coming, they're here for um, you know, a fertility treatment, they're trans feminine, they have this body part, this is what they need, just so that the receiving referrer is really clear of what their patient needs. What if I make a mistake? It's going to happen. It's just a part of how we learn. That's totally fine. It's totally okay. Like I say, language takes time and takes practice. If we do slip up or if someone corrects us, golden three-step process as easy as apologizing, correct yourself and move on. Oh, so sorry, Jen, and continue on with the conversation, right? Especially if you're in like a 15-minute consult and you have limited time, um, getting into it or um, trying to brush past it can feel uncomfortable. It can detract from the time you have together. So the most respectful thing is just to say, so sorry, correct yourself and move on with the conversation. So sharing some practical tips for allyship. Top tips of being an ally, like I touched on at the start, be visible is a really big one. Thinking about kind of every step of the process of someone engaging with your service. If you're in a GP practice, I would really recommend looking at your website. Um, I always recommend having a little sentence somewhere that says, you know, so-and-so practice is open to our whole community, including our Māori, our Pacific, our Rainbow, our trans, our disabled patients, etc. And it can feel a little, a little bit obvious, like we're, we're healthcare workers, we should be providing care to everyone equally. Um, but if you are someone who's had negative experiences and you're a little unsure and you're really looking for somewhere that you know you're going to be safe, that little explicit statement somewhere that's public facing on the website or in a staff profile or something like that really helps people know that it is a place they can go and, and feel safe and accepted, which is fantastic. And then thinking about the physical environment as well. Um, so thinking about posters that are available in waiting rooms, what's in your consult rooms, um, are those little visible, visible signals people can look at um, to reassure themselves that it's a safe place and feel more likely that they're going to be able to share. But we have to back it up with some practice, right? So we have to let our actions speak for us. We can't just do the visibility. We have to make sure we have some awareness ourselves of this rainbow competency work and the sensitivities we might need to have. 
Um, we should make sure that the rest of our practices have some of that understanding as well. It's not just clinicians, it's not just GPs and nurses, it's also like health improvement practitioners, health coaches, admin staff, receptionists. Everyone really has a role to play in building that really inclusive environment, so it's really important to make sure that the whole team is on board. Make no assumptions is a big one for healthcare. It's so easy for us as we're following the same language patterns we always have to say something like boyfriend, girlfriend, husband, wife, mum and dad is the one that trips me up all the time. Um, but we know that if someone is feeling particularly vulnerable or uncomfortable or unsure about sharing and we make an assumption about them like that that is incorrect, it puts them a little bit further, it builds that distance a little bit more, right? So we're trying to make as few, a few of those assumptions as possible and build up that trust as quickly as we can. And using inclusive language is a bit of a shortcut to that. So even if we're thinking boyfriend, girlfriend, husband, wife, mum and dad, if we say partner, if we say parents, then we haven't made that assumption out loud. So again, language is something that just takes time and practice, but it's, um, I think, a really useful thing to be investing some practice time into. Be curious about your own discomfort. It's really natural for us as human beings to have bias. It's a part of how we navigate the world. That's totally fine. Um, when we encounter our own bias, we experience it as discomfort. Um, so it's important to be able to, to sit with that feeling and examine it and reflect and think about it and be more mindful of what bias might be at play there. And then similarly, our bias comes from things, from our worldview, right? So we tend to have more bias about things that are new or different or unusual to us. So an easy way to start to unpick at those things is to learn more about the people in the experience, the world and the people and the experiences within it. So thinking about what we're watching, what we're listening to, what we're reading, what opportunities we have to learn more, um, all of that stuff can bring that more information to us on a regular basis. Okay, I'll leave it there. Um, please feel free to make use of this email, primarycare at qtopia.org.nz comes to me and um, comes through to the project team working on these um, uh, health education sessions around the country. Um, and then I'll hand over to Rona to take it from here. Wonderful, Jennifer. So thank you, Rona. Over to you. Excellent. So it's great to see so many of you interested in this topic. I know it's an area that's changing a lot and there's quite a lot of movement in this space in primary care, which I'm going to talk a bit about this evening as well. So just a little bit about me. This is the lovely team that I work at in my clinical practice at um, a student health service in Wellington. Um, and we have quite a unique service there where we have a little gender affirming healthcare team within the within the student health service. So I work with these uh, two counsellors and a nurse um, and now another GP as well. Um, providing gender affirming healthcare for uh, for the trans and non-binary students in that service. With a particular focus, uh, my work is particularly focused on initiating gender affirming hormone therapy. And that's what led me to uh, lead the writing of this document in green here, which are the primary care gender affirming hormone therapy initiation guidelines. It's a bit of a mouthful. Um, and I'm going to talk a, a little bit more about what that is uh, later. And then I've also put the PATHA logo here. Jen mentioned PATHA as well. I'm involved with PATHA and um, the Professional Association for Trans Health Aotearoa. And you're, um, you're all welcome to become members of that. There's an email discussion list. We can ask questions um, and we have... Um, uh, symposiums as well. So I've got quite a lot of things that I'm just going to touch on briefly, like so it hopefully gives you a bit of a broad overview and an update and maybe answer some of those questions that you might have. What's happening around New Zealand and gender affirming healthcare? What are these guidelines? Touch a tiny bit on fertility and contraception, just as a kind of just so that you're aware of that, and then talk a bit about hormones, um, surgery, and yeah, and some some current updates. So when, when I'm using the term gender affirming healthcare, um, I'm really talking here about medical interventions that people access to affirm their gender. So you've heard um, about sort of gender identity and uh, gender expression and the difference between those things. So if somebody's um, gender as, that they've been assigned at birth doesn't doesn't match that gender identity, uh, that can be cause a lot of discomfort and that sort of uh, uh, sometimes distress and uh, sort of incongruence between the two and, and gender affirming healthcare includes things that can help to uh, help to make to make that more comfortable and to and to feel for people to feel more like themselves. 
Um, and as you've heard, this stuff is really individual and no two people are going to want or need the same thing. So it's really about listening to the person in front of you and asking them what's right for them. So it's very individual, um, but it can include things like counselling, hair removal, voice therapy, uh, puberty blockers, hormones and surgeries. So where um, so my role is really much more around hormones as well as kind of linking people in with some of those other things. This is a real kind of loose sort of snapshot of what is happening around Aotearoa with gender affirming healthcare. Um, this was back when they were still called DHBs. And this is a kind of comparison from 2019 in the centre to 2021 on the outside. Um, there may be a new one of these coming for 2023. Um, and it's just sort of the number of each of those 20 DHBs that are providing those services. So you can see that there has been an increase in over time, but also that um, in some some of these are, are pretty low, uh, pretty low in number. And pretty variable. That's the big thing about this healthcare. And I know there'll be people here this evening who are working all across the Motu and it, it really is still does still feel like a bit of a postcode lottery and that what you can access it very much still depends on where you live. And I hope that's something that will be changing over the next uh, number of years as some of our pathways progress. So in terms of kind of guidelines that um, that guide the work in this area and the clinicians who do this work, most of it is based upon the WPATH standards of care that stands for the World Professional Association for Transgender Health. And this is the most recent one, version eight, which um, came out last year. That's a pretty long document, but um, luckily we have some more kind of summarized, uh, localized guidelines to use, which are, but they are based on the WPATH um, standards of care. So these are the local guidelines that we have in Aotearoa. The one on the left with the power shell cover are the national guidelines, but they're, um, they're a little bit old now and they're currently in the process of being updated. So you can expect to see um, a much more uh, recent and updated version uh, next year. Um, and these green ones are the ones I mentioned at the beginning, which really came from when I started doing this work um, around hormone initiation. I, I couldn't easily find the information other than from our local sort of endocrinology service that couldn't really find the information that I needed, the sort of details around that hormone prescribing and um, and also that's the, the approach that we use in, in student health in my practice, but also the other clinicians, the other GPs around the country who do this work in primary care. And so it was kind of bringing all of our experiences together and to share that approach um, and the kind of prescribing protocols with the wider, uh, wider community in primary care so that other people who want to do this work have got those answers and have got that information at their fingertips as well, rather than us all kind of holding it in our individual practices. So they're very practically focused, very, um, yeah, I mean, they're, they're fairly long, but very kind of simple with like tables and, and um, protocols and things which are easy to follow. And I'll come back to um, what I'm talking about when I'm talking about hormone initiation in primary care in a minute. Just changing tack slightly because I want to include these two important things around fertility and contraception. So um, it does, it seems slightly out of the blue in this bit of the talk, but um, I'll go with it. So uh, fertility preservation for trans people, fertility associates is uh offers this and they have if you go onto their website they've got a special section for lgbtq people and on that is the you'll find this leaflet about transgender fertility so that's and that's for patients so that's quite a useful resource for people who are wondering what's out there but basically um in terms of surgical and in terms of medical so hormone and surgical uh gender affirming care sperm preservation is funded uh for trans people who are going on to um, estrogen based hormone therapy um so that is something that's really important to offer and discuss with everybody in that situation so that they know that's an option and that they can access that and it's funded um egg freezing for um is not funded unless you're having surgical removal of your uterus and ovaries. So people going on to hormones, so that's that's people assigned female at birth. They might identify as transgender male or non-binary or transmasculine. Um, if those people are starting testosterone, there's no, it's not funded for them to have um, eggs frozen. And that's partly because 
I'm, I don't, I'm not going to spend ages on this. We can contact me if you want to discuss it in more detail, but, but the quality of the eggs are not affected by the testosterone. So there are some uncertainties about whether or not testosterone affects people's ability to become pregnant, but the, the quality of the eggs isn't changed. So they can, they, if they did need fertility preservation, um, assistance sorry in the future they could still use their eggs uh to to do that but if you're having a surgical removal then it's funded just a reminder about contraception really important for um for all people on gender affirming hormone therapy testosterone and estrogen don't stop you from becoming pregnant or from being able to make someone else pregnant um testosterone is not not a contraception even even if people's periods have stopped and so if they're having sex that could result in pregnancy they do need to use contraception um and yeah just putting that in there as a reminder really and just a little in the in the blue box there a little reminder about language as well you know jen talked about that as well just keeping things really general so it's not like have you got a boyfriend or are you having sex with a man or you know it is are you having sex that could result in pregnancy because that's really what we want to know isn't it um and um, knowing the gender of people's partners doesn't actually tell us anything so this is a, a an area where things are kind of moving and, and changing and both nationally and internationally there is a move towards a more primary care based approach to hormone initiation um and what this does is it's um, moves away from the more traditional kind of path where there's a mandatory psychology, psychological assessment towards a more individualized, um, informed consent approach, <clears throat> which really respects people's um, bodily autonomy, respects people's right to make their own decisions about their body and their lives, and recognizes that adults with capacity can, can make those informed decisions and can provide consent and, and when they're well informed, make their own decisions about their own health care. Um, and that's so that's uh, what the primary care guidelines approach is. So this has been the kind of this is still the common pathway across a lot of the country. Um, this kind of more traditional, you know, somebody might come see their GP to talk about hormone therapy. So that abbreviation GAT, I use that throughout. That stands for gender affirming hormone therapy. Um, and then the GP pathway for referral is usually to uh, usually people would end up needing to see a mental health professional such as a psychologist to have what has been termed a readiness assessment for hormones or a psychological assessment. And then from there would would go on to see someone in secondary care, usually endocrinology or sexual health, depending on where you live in the country. All of this depends on where you live. Um, and they would then start people's hormone therapy and then discharge back to the GP for ongoing prescribing. But these, this approach is changing, like I say, because we've come a long way and we've recognized that actually there's no way that every single adult who's transgender needs to see a psychologist before starting hormones. I mean, you know, we don't do that for a whole bunch of other medical things that potentially you could argue might need that. Um, and really that, um, Adults with capacity to consent can 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 do that, can provide consent and understand information and make their own decisions. So whilst there might be lots of other support or other things that are needed, those are all things which we do every day in general practice um, and don't necessarily need a kind of formal assessment to, to organize. So these are kind of some alternative pathways that are, are becoming um yeah, becoming a bit more common now. So the one down the left here is that kind of traditional um, mental health professional assessment and then secondary care. Some GPs, particularly people who maybe are starting out in, in hormone initiation, because there's quite a lot to kind of remember and get on board with, might might do the prescribing bit themselves once once someone's had a psychology assessment, just because it, it just while they're getting sort of used to things and learning. But this one down the right is what um, an increasing number of GPs are doing. Um, and this is the way that I work, where um, the whole kind of process can be done in, in general practice uh, with the skill set that, that GPs and nurses and nurse practitioners have. Absolutely, that needs more time and funding. That's kind of a, a whole other conversation, but I want to get on to a few other things. <clears throat> so this, this uh, is a table from the... Uh, the primary care guidelines. So this is kind of the approach that, you know, it really takes you through all these stages and talks about that approach. So it's not like first one 15 minute prescription and here's your hormones. There's a whole lot of stuff to kind of go through 
to gather information, get to know the patient, gather information about, about them and their life and their support needs and their identity and their goals for hormones. There's some kind of medical stuff to consider, including fertility, like we've briefly touched on. And um, there's a whole bunch of hormone information and education for the prescriber to discuss and, and give to the patient. Um, and then, you know, after all of that, there's um you know, the, the prescription and how long those stages take those first three stages, for example, is so variable depending on the practitioner's experience, um, you know, how, how quickly and easily you can do that. And also the patient in front of you, you know, and um, certainly for some people that might be uh, a, a pretty quick, straightforward process and other people it will take a bit longer. Um, so this, these are quotes that have come from uh, patients in my practice when we've done a bit of an evaluation and asked them how gender affirming healthcare uh, has impacted their life and well-being, I think the question was. Um, and I'll leave you to read those yourself, but you can see that, I mean, it's just life changing in, in such a positive way that uh, that's why I do this work, because I see every day, every time I go to clinic, I um, see the difference this makes. And it's just incredibly rewarding and really pretty straightforward way to um, to really make a difference in people's well-being and happiness and health and lives. So I'm not going to talk specifically anymore about how to start hormone therapy. That's kind of a, another talk and is quite a big topic, but I'm just really putting it out there that this is a thing that a number of GPs around the country are doing. People are becoming increasingly interested. Um, we have a GP peer group for people who are interested in this kind of thing. And I'll put some contacts at the end so that if, if you're keen to, to get more involved and to look into upskilling in that area, there's some more education and opportunities to do so. But what I'm going to talk about now is a bit of specific medical stuff about hormones, but with a bit more of a focus, you know, thinking more around those kind of repeat prescriptions, which is what most of you will be more familiar, uh, you know, be doing more in your daily work. Um, so the hormones may have been started elsewhere by someone else, but those patients are likely to come back to you um, for ongoing repeat prescriptions. So what do you need to know? And what do you need to think about? So I'm going to start, I'm going to split this into... Um, you know, um, estrogen and testosterone, basically. And I'm using this abbreviation EGAT for estrogen based gender affirming hormone therapy or feminizing hormones, as we used to sort of say. So this first bit is really some things. So if you are seeing a patient who wants to start hormones and you're referring them on to someone else, these are some of the things you could be thinking about in the meantime, because there's likely to be a bit of a wait. You'll have to look at your local pathway to see um, what the options are for hormone initiation in your region. But these are some of the things you could be thinking about for people starting feminizing hormones. So that might be somebody who's assigned male at birth, who's a transgender female or non-binary, trans feminine, any number of things like that. Um, so you could be talking about fertility because the hormones are going to affect fertility. And is, are they interested in having a referral while they're waiting to have um, fertility preservation? Depending on where what region you're in, there might be gender affirming voice therapy av available and the hormones don't change the voice. So people might be really grateful for a referral for that. You could take the opportunity to discuss sexual health and um, laser hair removal is, is another really useful and often wanted uh, gender affirming kind of health care thing procedure um that does need to usually be accessed privately but uh wins will will fund that and you can uh, on a disability allowance if someone's eligible for a disability allowance um and you know your health pathway might give you this information about some baseline bloods that someone could do especially if you're referring to fertility for fertility preservation so the hormones that we're talking about here are estrogen, of course, but also a testosterone blocker. So you really need to use both of these together. And these are the things that you'll, um, I would expect that you'll be seeing that your patients are on and what those repeat prescriptions will be for. So with estrogen, there's really two options here. There's tablets, so Proganova, um, and that's the usual dose range there, and Aura patches, um, like uh, Estradot most commonly. And as you know, there's been quite a lot of on and off supply issues with that at the moment. Um, all the all of the doses, all of the kind of medical details that I've got on some of these slides are all in those primary care guidelines. So I really I'm not going to go over loads of numbers and things. You can find 
all of that in the primary care guidelines. So even if you're not initiating hormones, they're a super useful resource just to check if you're doing a repeat prescription, think what blood test did I need to do? Or what dose, if a patient wants to adjust the dose of something, what was the dose I can use? Um, because absolutely you can, you can go ahead and make dose adjustments or, or switch between these medications um, in general practice, um, as long as you're sort of sticking with the usual dose ranges and sticking within those guidelines. So with estrogen, you've got tablets or patches. Um, and if somebody wants to switch from one to the other, you know, you can you can do that. Um, then the testosterone blocker options that people are on would be either spironolactone or cyprotrone. There's a bit of I've noticed a bit of regional variation in terms of prescribing preference and what so where you're working might depend on what you see more of that. I work in Wellington and certainly we do have um, a preference for prescribing spironolactone here with um, because it has such good long term safety data. You know, we've been using spironolactone forever and we know a lot about its uh, long term use and it's pretty low risk as long as you monitor someone's potassium when you're starting and adjusting the dose. Um, and yeah, that's it really doesn't sort of cause too many problems. Um, whereas cyprotrone is, you know, it can affect, it can cause low mood. It's a risk, you know, it's a um, contraindicated in severe depression. And, and we know that there is quite a lot of uh, depression amongst this population. It can cause fatigue and sometimes shortness of breath. Um, and over longer term, there are some risks um, with the liver function and um, the development of meningioma as well. Now that data seems to be around high doses of cyprotrone over a long time. And certainly with this, in this use, we use very low doses, but we don't have the data. So we you know, hope that the meningioma risk wouldn't so much be there with the low doses, but we don't actually have the research to show that yet. Um, there, uh, there's also of course an increased risk of um, thromboembolism with cyprotrone, which is you know, why we have caution with Jeanette, for example. So really, if someone's on cyprotrone, I would encourage you to get them down to the, the lowest dose that you can, because it's really effective at suppressing testosterone at really low doses. So we would uh, usually never go above 12 and a half milligrams a day. So that's a quarter of a tablet because it only comes in 50 milligram tablets. So quarter of a tablet, you can even do that every second day or sometimes, um, you know, some Australian colleagues are just using it twice a week. Um, especially if someone's on patches, they can change their patch, estrogen patch, and take their um, cyprotrone, and that's enough to really suppress the testosterone. If someone has an orchiectomy, they can stop their testosterone blocker, don't forget. I'm not going to talk about the other ones at the moment because there's a lot to cover. Um, again, all of this information is in those guidelines. The estrogen choice, just that um, patches are, are, have a lower VTE risk and are going to be safer in people with higher cardiovascular risk um, and older people. Um, with the testosterone blocker, I've talked about those kind of safety concerns between the two and why I favor spironolactone. But um, it's important to remember that they work differently as well. So spironolactone blocks the effect of testosterone at the receptors on the tissues, whereas cyprotrone stops it from being released. So if you measure someone's testosterone level on cyprotrone, it's going to be really low and it's going to, that's going to feel reassuring. You can say, look, I know it's a tiny dose, but look, you've got very, very low testosterone. Whereas with spironolactone, the testosterone um, measurement isn't particularly useful. Um, so because it's not necessarily stopping it from being produced, but it is stopping it from having any action at the tissue. So that requires a bit of explaining to patients so that they understand why, you know, I don't measure someone's testosterone level on spironolactone because it just seems no point because it doesn't actually tell us anything. And we know it's going to be a bit, a bit higher than people might otherwise let, like, but that doesn't mean it's not block, being blocked. I hope that makes sense. Um, so these are the physical effects of uh, the estrogen based hormone therapy. And um, all of this is explained in lots of detail before people start hormones. I have put a little red star next to the permanent changes, because one of the biggest aspects of the informed consent with hormones, as well as making sure that all the information is there, is that people really understand the permanent changes. And um, so for this, it's breast growth and um, the infertility, likely infertility, which is why everyone is offered um, fertility preservation. And there's a bit of timeline uh, things here. I'm not going to go into the details. Although it can be helpful, this is linked to on the patient information sheet in the guidelines. And I do find this a useful diagram to show people um, if they come in a bit further down the track, perhaps 
wanting to change their medication or doses because they're not very happy with some of the effects. And, you know, sometimes looking at this and if it's still, I don't know, six months or in that first year or something, you could, it's quite a helpful visual to be like, look, this takes time. It's gradual. And you can see that there's still a lot of this sort of journey and changes to come. Um, again, this table is from the primary care guidelines, so you can find it there. I'm not going to go through it in detail other than to say that if your patient is on hormone therapy, that they should have these blood tests monitored. We usually do it more frequently in the first year on hormones, but after that, if they're well and everything's stable, you know, once a year might, might be plenty um, and a blood pressure check as well. And if you're wanting to, if you're getting those results and not sure how to interpret them, have a look at the guidelines and, and it should all be there for you. So I'll just move on now to uh, testosterone. Uh, gender affirming hormone therapy so this might be people who are assigned female at birth who are a transgender man or non-binary trans masculine person some of the things if if you've got a patient so just taking a step back again if a patient's coming to see you and you're referring them elsewhere to be started on hormones these are some of the things that could be useful to discuss menstrual cessation can be a really helpful thing to offer while they're waiting testosterone does usually stop people's periods but uh, some people can have quite a lot of distress and dysphoria with their periods and, um, and we can easily offer something in the meantime to stop that contraception if that's needed um, as we discussed that's important and we don't want people to get pregnant on testosterone um, you might want to ask them a, a, whether they use a binder a lot of transmasculine people have a lot of dysphoria and discomfort from their chest and so it's very common um, well it's very common for people to be seeking top surgery I'll talk about surgery in a minute but it's also common for people to use a binder which is a uh, sort of tight fabric um, that goes around the chest to sort of uh, flatten um, to create a more masculine appearance and flatten the chest but sometimes that can cause you know there's some safety things that need to be taken into consideration with how people use binders um, so it can sometimes cause breathing difficulty or pain and so um, there's some good information online and in Wellington we're lucky enough to have gender affirming physiotherapy service to refer people to. So if people are interested in menstrual cessation, it's all the usual um, sort of options and, and what you choose would depend on whether they need contraception or not. And this table is from those guidelines. So um, you can go and have a look there if you want to check the doses of uh, progesterone or anything. So testosterone is a, a wee bit more straightforward because it's just one medication. Um, and the vast majority of people will be uh, having it as an injection. So it does come in patches or tablets. Um, tablets are not commonly used. Patches are sometimes used, but skin irritation is common. So really the vast majority of people will be on an injection. And these are the three that we have available. So Reandron is given every three months. Sustanon is three weekly and Depo testosterone um, fortnightly usually. And these are, this is the similar table as the other one, but with the testo effects of testosterone um, and the timings. And like, like I said, all of this is discussed in great detail before people start hormones. But I've, again, put a red star next to those permanent changes. And you can see there's quite a few there, um, including facial hair, um, a deeper voice, and... Um, uh, sorry, and genital changes as well. So... It's typically in the community, people use the term bottom growth, um, which refers to the growth of the clitoris that happens on testosterone. So it does um, grow a few centimeters. Uh, and there are some other genital changes such as vaginal atrophy and, and dryness. And that's really important to know if you are going to be doing a speculum examination on someone on testosterone, you know, you might want to give them topical, consider give, offering topical estrogen for a couple of weeks beforehand and also using plenty of lubrication. Um, as for because it's going to be more uncomfortable and, and dry. Um, and of course, keeping in mind the dysphoric aspects of, of how somebody feels about their genitals, it could be a, quite a challenging examination for somebody. So there's a few things you can offer to make that more comfortable. So the mon monitoring, again, this table is from the guidelines. The sort of take home points would be um, that one of the differences with estrogen is that we do, you do need to monitor the um, hematocrit because that can sometimes go up with testosterone and um and might need to adjust the dose if, if that's the case but really make sure when you're getting 
particularly when you're getting a blood test back with the the someone on testosterone, their full blood count and their testosterone level, check that it's the f- male reference range that the lab is using because the lab is doesn't always know what to put. And so often I'll see um, colleagues might send me through blood results to look at and it's all come up in red and it's out of the reference range, but it's it's got, because it's using the female reference range. So you want to use the male reference range for um, the full blood count. Um, and with the testosterone level, we do want to monitor that. It takes a bit of time for that to stabilize. So we don't check it too early. Um, and we'd be aiming for the, the usual male reference range and, unless someone is um, particularly asking for a lower dose and monitoring the blood pressure as well. And with the testosterone level, the timing of the blood test matters. So again, if you're looking at a testosterone result from someone who's on gender affirming hormone therapy test for tests, you know, testosterone gender affirming hormone therapy, check when the blood test was taken in relation to their injection, because with Reandron, we want that trough level taken just before their injection. But if they're on depot testosterone or sustenone, we take that midway between injections. So there's just a few things to, to think about there when you're interpreting and, and requesting those blood tests. So that was a bit of a whiz through, but um, a lot of the things that you might want to know or things that you want to check if you're doing a repeat prescription for someone on hormones, there is really good information out there. So this is one of the med cases from the Goodfellow unit, which I wrote. It's a little bit, I don't think it's particularly out of date. It's pretty good. And so you'll find a lot of those answers there, but you'll definitely find all the answers in the primary care guidelines. And you can flick forward past all the writing to get to the tables and the bits that you need to know. So I'm just going to change tack for a minute and um, just very briefly mention a couple of things about surgery. Um, Apart from genital surgery, which I'll talk about, it's very variable depending on where you live. So you really would need to check your local pathways to see what's available. In general, things are not very easily accessible or easily available is the the sort of summary. Um, These are the kinds of things that people might be looking for, chest surgery, or top surgery, as most people in the community would call it, uh, a, a bilateral mastectomy, like I mentioned, is a really, um, I think that's the biggest unmet need I see in my patients um, is a real, a real strong need for um, top surgery, which is currently unavailable really in our region. Um, and that causes a huge amount of distress. Um so genital surgery, I'll very briefly tell you about. There is This is the only one which is managed at the moment on a national level. We have one gender affirming genital surgeon in the country, um, Rita Yang. She's uh, based in Wellington, but she sees people from all over the country, but they have to come to Wellington for their surgery. And so the wait list for this is coordinated by Tefatu Ora. And this web page that I've um, got a little screenshot of there, has got really good information and really good information for patients. So if you're wondering what the referral criteria are or you want to refer someone, all the information is there over the referral forms and particularly the criteria which um, you need to look at. Or if your patient is thinking about whether this is right for them, there's some really good patient information leaflets as well, which really um, give an overview of what the different surgeries are, what that means for people, because this is a really big surgery to have and people need to be um, really fit and well enough to undergo a big complex surgery and a a long anesthetic. So all the details are on that website. Uh, Unfortunately, the demand far exceeds the capacity and there's a very long waiting list for this. Um, But certainly my experience, a lot of patients will be keen to, to be referred and to be on this wait list, even though they know it's incredibly long because well I guess first of all things can change and who knows you know what's going to happen um, but also it sort of shows that demand really as well and that that need so there's currently all the numbers are are really transparent on the website there and there's about 400 and I don't know 10 people um, as it well that was earlier this year there were about 410 people on the wait list and um, Dr Rita Yang's funded to do about 14 surgeries per year so you can do the maths and realize how long that wait list is. And as you can see on this, the vast majority are uh, transgender female or you know feminizing surgery that people are wanting. 
Um, yeah, we don't need to go into great detail of that, just that there are some criteria uh, for the referral. You have to be over 18, medically fit, it's complex surgery. You need to be nicotine free, non-smoker, not vaping nicotine. And there are some BMI requirements as well, which are detailed on the website. Um, some regions, so in some regions, it needs to be someone in secondary care who does the referral. There's, I, I don't think there's a particularly good reason for that because GP is usually the person who knows the patient best. And in Wellington, we have an arrangement where the GPs can refer. So if you are someone who does have a lot of trans patients and you would like to be able to do these referrals and are not currently able to, I would say just contact them. There's a genital surgery email address at Tafatawara and explain that to them because um, they might you know, be able to change that for your area or for you. So almost finished, um, just a couple of updates. There is a bit of movement in terms of, um, there was some funding allocated in last year's budget for gender affirming healthcare, and it had a particular focus on primary care. And so this, kind of, this work is kind of starting now. And so it includes updating the national guidelines, which I mentioned. Um, so those will be out next year. And that will then lead, it's leading on to clinical pathway development. I'm not quite sure what that's going to look like. So we'll see. Um, workforce development is another arm of that because people, uh, you know, we can see that lots of you are here and keen for education and there's an increasing number of people who want to learn more and, and do more. And particularly, like I mentioned about the hormone initiation, that takes a bit of time to do some training and education around that. And um, we've now got the availability, the ability to do that. So I've put um, that Jen's primary care Qtopia email address there because um, Jen is kind of the coordination and go to point to to access that. It's not quite it's not ready yet, but we can if, if it's something that your region or your practice is really keen to to get uh, to, to make happen, you know, uh, we can add you to a list or something. Um, and then the third one is community driven models of care. There is a little bit of money around some actual health care provision. Um, uh, early days, we'll see what, where that goes. And just a quick plug for um, this upcoming conference. So um, OzPath has got a conference in Melbourne in November in collab uh, collaboration with PATHA. Um, so it's it's going to be awesome. It's in Melbourne, but it is also available online. It's a hybrid conference. So if you want to join up online, there'll be an option to like be able to watch the videos for like of the talks for about six months afterwards. And if you're interested in trans healthcare, it's an awesome opportunity to network and, and um, get some updates on what's happening. Um, and I can, uh, we might be able to post these uh, resources on the, on the Goodfellow page for the, uh, for the webinar uh, that we do have a peer group I've put my email address there I'm as long as you don't all email me like tonight you can you're welcome to email me with medical questions or wanting pointing in the right direction I do know a lot about what's happening around the region or people in your region who might be doing this work if you want to connect with people and we do have a national GP peer group and um, which runs on zoom uh, which you can be added to as well Thank you very much. How are we doing for time? Not too bad. A bit of time for questions. I'll stop sharing. Wonderful. Thank you, Rona, for your talk and your very, very generous offer of your email. Um, and <laughs> I I you might regret not, that. <laughs> you're not swamped. So yes, go gently with that one. I wonder if we can just start perhaps, um, Jennifer, with the first question directed at you. So if you're wanting to make your practice more friendly, where is a good place to get some signage, please? Yes, absolutely. So I um, chucked some links in the text answer to that question, but there are two places I'd be looking. One is the Be There website. So that's b-there.nz, um, which is a program created by the Rainbow Organizations across the country aimed at parents, caregivers, Fano of Rainbow Young People that has these beautiful posters and flyers you can print off um, and put in your practice. And the other one is Rainbow Mental Health, um, which is a beautiful resource aimed at mental health practitioners, but is really accessible and useful for anyone looking to build a more inclusive um, service environment. Um, and they also have some really great, gorgeous posters that you probably will have seen around at this point. They've um, got beautiful New Zealand bird imagery on them. They're free to download and print off. Um, so a couple of those in waiting rooms and consult rooms is a great place to start. Wonderful. Thank you. Um if we're wanting to upskill as a primary care provider, 
or perhaps a med student who's wanting to hook in with a, a practice, how would we go about doing that? So you mentioned gypsies. So um, let's talk about that in the first instance. I think there's different ways, like if you attend education, you know, come to our upcoming education that we're developing at the moment, come to the conference, uh, things like this, uh, read the primary care guidelines, just kind of really using those those different areas to upskill. And if you if you do the kinds of things that Jen's talked about in terms of sort of signage and showing that you are there and you are a safe person to come and see and you're, you know, welcoming People will come and um, word of mouth is really big amongst the community, I would say. And so um, if you want to get into this work and see more trans patients, uh, you, you can just kind of put that out there and, and it will it will naturally happen. But upskilling um, is really important. You know, as Jen said, you can't you don't want to just stick a flag up in a waiting room. You've got to have something something behind that as well. And so, um yeah, coming to things like this, coming to the education sessions, joining the peer group, reading the online stuff. There isn't a specific kind of qualification. Th those of us who call ourselves gypsies in this area have kind of just self, you know, given ourselves that name. New Zealand doesn't have, uh, unlike the UK and Australia, where you do have more formal gypsy uh, role. And in Australia, the College of GPs there have, have now got a special interest group, which they support for um, transgender affirming healthcare. We're not quite there here, but... Um, with this budget that I talked about for the workforce development, there's going to be a program through that where you can work through and really have developed competencies, particularly around hormone initiation or more general gender affirming healthcare, um, with a kind of, you know, a, a sort of a, a course that you can have completed and, and sort of a certification. So that is coming. Fantastic. Jennifer, I wonder if we can ask you the next question. So we've got a teenager in our room who is questioning their sexuality. We have about two minutes left in our consultation because it's been thrown in at the end. Where can we direct our teenager? Yes, we love to throw it in, throw it in at the end, don't we? Um, for, for someone who is really feeling unsure about where they're at in their journey and kind of what's next for them, I would I think the first port of call I'd be looking at is some kind of community peer support options because um, that's a really great place for people to start to learn more and to kind of connect in with other people on similar pathways and to um, talk to people with their own kind of lived experience around that. So again, it varies around the country as to what's available. Um, all the rainbow organizations are really good at talking to each other. So if you email me and you're in um, uh, Auckland, I can connect you with the organizations up there who can provide that kind of care. Um, in Waitaha, we have a peer support service exactly for this kind of thing. In Wellington, you've got organizations like Gender Minorities and Inside Out. Um, so I'd be looking to your local community organizations for that kind of support as well. Fantastic. Now thinking about access to care, because this is a big one. Um, if someone is living rurally, access is often not as good as perhaps we would like it to be. So thinking about fertility preservation, how can we go about that for somebody living rurally? And is it enough for us to do a good informed consent and then initiate hormones or does that need to be referred on? It's such a well-known issue that people in rural areas struggle to access this healthcare. And it's why it's it's one of the reasons why getting more GPs involved in this work is so important and is going to make a huge difference to the, to the community. There's absolutely no reason why you can't... Um, uh, okay, you can't like freeze someone's sperm yourself, but in terms of hormone initiation and doing that sort of in-house in a GP practice, that can absolutely be done. And there's plenty of us who do that every day around the country. Um, it's really just about upskilling. So you've got the right information to share with people and uh, and sort of having that confidence to do it. But yeah, absolutely. And I mean, te telehealth, I think has another role potentially in this, but um, yeah, Jen, you might, you've got some experience with more rural areas as well. You might have more to say. Yeah. And I think for fertility in particular, I think it's really worth encouraging patients to think really seriously about their fertility options, especially if, that, if we're talking, you know, 18, 19, 20, because you ask any 18 year old whether they want, whether they want to have kids and a lot of them are going to say absolutely not, never. Um, but it's really a better safe than sorry conversation and um, really encouraging them to, to take it seriously and think seriously about it. But fertility preservation is obviously isn't a requirement to accessing this care. So if you've had that conversation with them and you feel like they've, you know, been able to really seriously consider it and they've said, no, I'm not interested, I want to move on, um, then that's totally fine as well. Yeah. And I suppose from our end, making sure that's really well documented uh, would be important. 
surgery. So with limited uh, access to surgery in New Zealand, people often go overseas. So what's your experience with people going overseas? What are the results? Is this something that we should be discussing with our patients? What should we be telling them? Yeah, I, I mean, it's absolutely people will go to all sorts of desperate measures and lengths and distances to access this stuff that's really needed and really inaccessible. And um, so we do see people going overseas often. Um, it's certainly cheaper in most cases than accessing it privately here. But there are some there are some issues with doing that. I mean, it depends. You know, there are places there are just differences, right, you know, in terms of surgeons and skill and um sort of motives and that you know like uh and and so people need to think about that really carefully and especially so there's different sorts of surgeries of course but with genital surgery for example um there's a lot of really important education that's needed before it and a lot of really important aftercare and understanding of that aftercare and that doesn't always happen well depending on where you where people go and then people can run into problems and complications when they're back home and who looks after that, you know, you can't go see your surgeon for follow-up. And, and so there are definitely some issues with that. Um, I think personally as a GP, it's really hard to advise people. I mean, I, I, there's, I wouldn't necessarily advise specific surgeons or places to go because we just can't know. And it was more, I think, sort of getting people to think about some of those different things that they might not have thought about, that it's not just pay your money and go see this person. There's a, there's a, and the support you have afterwards as well. Are you taking someone with you and how well supported are you? People don't always quite get how, how big these things can be, but what do you yeah. think for the community, Jen? I'd really, really encourage those conversations about post-surgery complications, right? Cause I think it, that, that's where a lot of people aren't quite so aware and is where things can really get difficult after coming back into the country. Um, I would really recommend people um, encourage those referrals to that national service because those numbers are, are really, really daunting as to how many people are waiting. But, um, you know, you never know what might happen. And, and to share from, from my own uh, perspective, just in the last couple of weeks, I had my first specialist assessment for, for that service and I was referred in 2019. So when I was referred, I was expecting for 50 years Years was was the calculated wait time then and, and it's been four so um, the, the numbers are really really daunting and it puts a lot of people off um, but it's always worth making that referral regardless and, and encouraging them, them to get on that list. That's right because some of those people who've been on that wait list for a very long time because of the historical uh, way that that list was managed before Rita came on board that they might if people change their mind they don't want the surgery anymore when it's kind of their turn or or they might not be fit for surgery for medical reasons and you know it's always shifting and moving yeah also sticking overseas uh, patients will go overseas and purchase hormone therapy so your thoughts on this again it's about access right so obviously that's not the ideal situation um, but as kind of Rona touched on in, in her piece for so long it's really been a postcode lottery around the country as to what's available and particularly for those those folks in rural areas access has, has been really difficult um, from a community perspective what I really encourage um, clinicians to think about is what we can do in, in terms of harm reduction um, as much as we possibly can right if people are people are going to be doing this anyway what can we do to make sure they're um, being really safe and we're able to en encourage them to keep safe around that as well Fantastic. yeah sometimes you know with some of my patients that I've seen it's been about around there's huge delays and wait lists and, and and access like you say so I would much rather be able to prescribe that and provide that safely myself in a you know in a monitored kind of uh, an appropriate way uh, then they go buying things online, which could I've seen, you know, people buying all sorts of things. It's a bit scary. So again, a great reason to just normalize this as well and bring it. It's not, you know, this talk hasn't been about how to initiate hormones, but it's not hard. It's real straightforward. And, you know, why wouldn't we do that for our patients if that's one of their needs, except uh, funding and time, I know. But um, apart from that, um, and uh, what was I going to say? Yes. And, you know, for example, I had someone who who really couldn't wait any longer and had, had self-started estrogen based hormone therapy, but nobody had, hadn't thought about fertility or no one had talked about that. And when I brought it up, they were like, that's really important to me. And I really want to do that. And I just thought, oh, I hope it's not too late. Yeah. Thinking um, about uh, somebody who's on estrogen-based uh, hormone therapy and uh, you do your bloods and you see an elevated prolactin level, 
what do we need to worry about here and do we repeat it or do we refer on? What we've actually said in the primary care guidelines is not to check it routinely. So the first question is, why is it being checked? We shouldn't be just checking it routinely. It, 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 there's all sorts of medications which can, you know, slightly elevate it and it's and it, it doesn't necessarily mean anything and people can get over investigated. So um, I would say to only check it if there is a reason, if there are symptoms that you're worried about of hyperprolactinemia. Um, because a slightly elevated one doesn't really mean much and I would ignore it. So it depends what numbers you're talking about and what the reason is and if there's any symptoms. Um, and then if it is, you know, decently high or there are symptoms, you can, write, you know, get some advice from endocrinology probably in that situation. But but I would say just don't go checking it randomly for no reason. And a discussion around withdrawing hormone replacement therapy when should we be doing this and uh, what would be the reasons to have those discussions? I mean, the only reason to stop is if the patient wants to stop it, really. I mean, when you get to very sort of old, you know, somebody mentioned menopause earlier, when you get to older age, there's a few differences and and, uh, and plenty of unknowns. But in general, um, we know that it's very unusual for people to stop hormone therapy. It's 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 rare, or or if it or they often or people who do stop it often come back to it. The other thing that's important to know with um, if people do decide to stop it is that uh, you know, as Jen's alluded to, there's a lot of misinformation and disinformation in this space. And so, what we know from research is that those it's rare for people to to want to stop it if they do there's a, it's very nuanced the reasons why people do that and it's very very rarely because they're cisgender you know often it's things like well actually I don't I'm non-binary and I particularly feel like I need hormones at the moment anymore it's not quite right for me or you know it's very rare that it's actual true regret it's often just sort of changes in people's journey or pressure and stigma from family and workplace and not being able to sort of live as they want to live so it's really um, unusual, but it's fine to stop it. If someone wants to stop it, they can just stop it. But I would be checking uh, checking in with them about why and if they're okay and if they need support, but also to doing a blood test to check the reproductive hormones to make sure you know things have kicked back in and they've got enough either estrogen or testosterone in their body. Fantastic. Thank you. And our final question for this evening, if somebody is referred into hospital, what services are available to an inpatient? Just looking at the, the text of the question, oh. I think a lot of a lot of the things we've talked about today in terms of building inclusive environments and general practice equally apply just as much, if if not more, to to hospital and inpatient and emergency rooms, right? I think particularly we're thinking about someone who is really stressed and feeling anxious and vulnerable and um, maybe there's an aspect of their identity which relates to their reason for being in hospital or being in ED um, even even more than, than in general practice perhaps those kind of visible signals of inclusion and allyship become even more significant because when someone's under that additional pressure they're maybe even less likely to share about something that could be really relevant so things like posters and um, I know lots of um, hospitals and medical schools now um, I think Otago has name badges that have pronouns um, on them as, as kind of standard and default which go a long way as well lots of those things we'll be thinking about in terms of inclusion for primary care require, apply in hospitals as well Absolutely. And enrollment forms and things, can people write their name and their gender on that? Yeah. All right. Well, thank you both for your time tonight. It's been an excellent presentation and um, you've given us lots of wonderful take home tips. So thank you for joining us this evening and enjoy the rest of your night.